Hello, and welcome to our channel Space Journey. Today, we will talk about why Starship SN20 will splash into the water instead of landing. We've seen test flights for all of the Starship prototypes up to the SN15. They've all tried to land on the ground thus far, which is to be anticipated. However, SpaceX is about to take a strange turn with the SN20. They're going to splash it into the water. Now the question that begs to be asked is, why? Why the absurd landing with the SN20? Will it be a safe method of landing if the Starship is crewed? Well, if you are interested to know the answers to these questions, stay until the end of this video. At the beginning, please support us with subscribing to our channel and liking this video so we can continue researching and making the best content about space for you. We have a lot of questions to answer, so let's not waste any more time and start the video right away. The SN20's prototype flight has been released. The Starship SN20, according to its specifications, will fly for 90 minutes, reach orbit, and circle the Earth once before crashing into the Pacific Oceans near Hawaii in a controlled way. The US Federal Aviation Administration has yet to verify and approve it, but that is unlikely to take long. Certainly, the concept of a spaceship landing in water rather than trying a safe landing is envisioned by SpaceX is odd. But the choice was made after much thought. You may recall the controversial Starship SN8 prototype test flight, which was the first prototype to be authorized for a high-altitude flying test. It climbed as anticipated and dropped in a similar manner through the horizontal fall intended to slow it down. However, the rocket failed to whip itself upright as it should have and a crash ensued from insufficient deceleration caused by erroneous pressure numbers. The prototype was completely destroyed by the impact, which resulted in a large explosion on the landing pad. Since the SN8, the SN9, SN10, and SN11 have all detonated at different times in the flight plans for different causes. The SN15 prototype's testing was deemed a resounding success. Although it was not without incident, as a brief fire broke out after it successfully landed. Despite the fact that the prototype had considerable upgrades over its predecessors, including a new avionics system, a new plumbing system, and a better Raptor rocket design, it was rejected. Clearly, SpaceX has hit a few stumbling blocks on its route to developing a spacecraft capable of reaching orbit and safely returning to Earth. Even more concerning is the fact that identical issues continue to crop up in successive prototypes. If the Starship is ever to become a viable alternative for long-distance space travel, these issues must be addressed. Keep in mind that with the Starship, SpaceX is venturing into uncharted terrain in the aerospace business. Prior to this, it was considered technologically impossible to construct a rocket that could be reused after its journey to space. SpaceX's engineers and scientists are actually taking notes as they go and tweaking things to see what works in the creation of this entirely new technology, with very little precedence to work with. Rocket science is no laughing matter, and it is now one of the most challenging scientific topics to master. However, SpaceX's design and prototyping mythology includes many prototype failures and accidents. They follow the idea of rapid prototyping, which enables them to develop prototypes that are both inexpensive and mass-producible. They won't miss out on critical time planning and adjustments based on fast incoming test results from quickly conducted and completed tests in this manner. This is why SpaceX must comply with an increasingly severe FAA and FCC regulations and bureaucracy. Constantly prototyping with a high possibility of failure raises the danger of damage in the domains of both agencies. This is also why Elon Musk's resolve to operate in this manner, despite the somewhat exclusive and somewhat remote Boca Chica location, implies SpaceX will go to any length to accomplish so. Liability is a key worry for a private firm. If one of their rocket launches or debris from exploding rockets injures or kills a private individual, they will almost certainly face draconian legal action. Federal agencies and the US government may be pressed to withdraw the company's licenses or even dissolve it forcefully. However, the technological aspect of the decision to remove the SN20 is straightforward. Further examination of the flight plan filed by SpaceX with the Federal Communication Commission indicates that the Starship prototype would re-enter the planet from orbit at an angle. 
Landing attempts on previous prototypes that flew high-altitude mission profiles started totally vertical. The biggest issues were encountered when the rocket flipped its orientation to dramatically reduce its speed before flipping up vertically again. This alternative technique of splashing into the water with the SN20 might be tried to see if the root cause of prior incidents still show up. This flight plan, however, presents a unique difficulty, as the rocket's re-entry into the atmosphere at such a high orbital speed might endanger people's lives and cause property damage if tried over land. Because the SN20 has newer technology and mechanics than earlier prototypes, SpaceX anticipates things to go wrong. The worst case situation would be for the Starship to completely disintegrate upon re-entry, with all debris dropping safely into the ocean without harming anyone or anything. The Space Shuttle Columbia tragedy in 2003 serves as a cautionary tale for SpaceX in developing this new mission plan. In 2003, after completing a space travel mission, the Space Shuttle Columbia re-entered Earth's atmosphere at orbital speed. A defective thermal protection system that was destroyed during takeoff was discovered to be the cause of the catastrophe. It resulted in the spacecraft's entire disintegration and the deaths of all crew members on board. One of the features of the SN20 is a new heat protection system, so they are correct to be concerned about similar tragedies, especially given the prototype was created so rapidly. In addition, a spaceship that lands undamaged can acquire far more information and data than a spaceship that lands wrecked or in ruins. Another compelling reason to land the spacecraft in the sea is that an undamaged Starship vehicle will give invaluable data to SpaceX engineers and scientists. All of the data may then be utilized to make the next prototype a resounding success in exactly the way they want it to be, safely landing back on a launch pad with no additional faults or concerns. We should also think about whether or not the Super Heavy rocket that will launch the SN20 into orbit will be recovered. SpaceX has made it plain that they want to make the Super Heavy rocket reusable as well, and they've even created a detailed 3D animation of the process. SpaceX has acquired disused oil fields in the Gulf of Mexico and converted them into seaborne landing pads for the rockets in order to make this a reality. They also have drone ships that serve as booster landing platforms. While it is not explicitly stated yet, it is very possible that the Super Heavy Booster prototype that will take the SN20 into space will also attempt to land safely on one of those seaborne landing pads. A recovered intact booster will similarly be of immense help and advantage in helping SpaceX make fast progress in eventually completing the design of the Starship and take it beyond the prototype stage. In conclusion, SpaceX opted to land the Starship in the sea because their calculations lead them to anticipate severe issues with the landing phase, and they wish to minimize the risk of harm to others. Because the landing method hasn't been fully fleshed out and nailed yet, a recovery approach that they know is generally safe is the best way to discover any remaining issues without losing a spaceship to destruction and disintegration. SpaceX appears to want to strive for double success with the rocket and the Starship for the next launch or two after this one. Given the improved feasibility of the Super Heavy booster being capable of properly descending for a safe landing. If all goes according to plan, SpaceX will perform their most critical spacecraft flight tests to date, and they will do so quickly between prototypes. SpaceX's ambition to create a never-seen-before spaceship that will convert science fiction into reality have definitely hit a number of roadblocks. Their operational techniques, on the other hand, have produced positive outcomes in the past. And with Elon Musk's active leadership in guiding them through the process, they can reliably create positive results in the future. We can only wish SpaceX and Elon Musk luck as they attempt to make history in an extraordinarily tough and precision-demanding effort. It is no little task to pave the path for regular human spaceflight, and the toll and demand placed on them are enormous. That brings us to the end of today's episode. As always, thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to support us by subscribing and liking this video. We will do our best to make more videos for you with fascinating and interesting happenings in our universe. But for now, that's it. See you soon.